Um, on behalf of the board of directors and staff, um, a lot of people to thank. Sanjoy, William Dalrymple, Namita Gokhale, Suresh Dingra, the Indian General Counsel, uh, Dr. Anupam Ray, the Indian Ambassador to the United States, uh, Harsh Shringla, and our colleagues at the Asia Society, Texas Center, Stephanie Tadwong, and Joy Partain. We're really grateful to everyone for making this possible. Um, Imprint is thrilled once again to take part in JLF Houston and to help program this event, which helps, which represents a thoughtful expansion of our corner of the global village. Houston is a diverse city, and we are delighted to see many of the aspects of that rich diversity reflected in the festival. Just tonight, to go from the fresh wonder of Daniela's poetry, thank you again, Daniela. Let's have a round of applause again for Daniela. To the mature insight and subtlety of Babsi Sidwa's fiction is to cover the trajectory of a sizable section of the literary universe. What riches we have here in these writers that will be featured throughout the day tomorrow, tackling everything from black holes to our medical industry, to the Middle East, to the mysteries of Texas, to poetry, fiction, the graphic novel, wrestling with matters of identity, race, religion, culture, history, time. We're grateful to you, all of you for taking part in the festival, and we look forward to tomorrow. At Imprint, we, tra we traverse this literary frontier all the time, empowering storytellers in every corner of our community, from the talented, international, emerging writers at the University of Houston, more than 500 of whom we have supported over the years with fellowships and prizes, to writers' workshops for incarcerated women and men at Harris County Jail, K through 12 school teachers across the region, healthcare providers at the Texas Medical Center, seniors writing their memoirs at various community centers, veterans of different wars. We send poets with typewriters to events, typewriters, I did say that to events and schools across the city, our in-print poetry buskers writing poems by request on any topic in English and Spanish. The in-print Margaret Root Brown reading series tomorrow, I'm, I'm sorry, Monday, launches its 39th season with the great novelist Colson Whitehead accessibly presenting nearly 400 of the world's literary masters in Houston. Our in-print Cool Brain series now in its 15th year offers the nation's great middle grade writers free of charge, giving free books to children, forging a new generation of readers and writers. We love our work and we see JLF Houston as yet another manifestation of our fierce dedication to the power of the written word. Now, tonight is very special for me personally because we have the opportunity to honor one of Houston's great writers a good friend and a terrific community member as well. Someone who has brought people together in the name of literature and culture for many years. She threw great parties, while at the same time writing a number of internationally renowned novels, each with an indelible voice and character, none other than Babs our beloved Babsi Sidwa. It's a real pleasure to honor her tonight. Um, her novels, The Crow Eaters, about a lively Zoroastrian family, The Bride, taking on the hard topic of honor killing, Cracking India, about the effects of partition from a child's perspective, An American Brat, what can happen when a child studies overseas, Water, about the cruel constraints of tradition. We are very fortunate in Houston to have had the benefit of Babsi's presence in our community for 35 years. She was a fearless trailblazer when she launched her career as a female writing fiction in English in South Asia in the 1970s. And when Babsi moved to Houston in the 1980s, she flourished, teaching at leading universities across the country and writing brilliantly. 
it's high time we honor one of our leading literary citizens who is also an international treasure. Thank you all for being here to be a part of that. And before we hear from Babsy, we'll see a brief excerpt from a documentary that is currently on, uh, in production. It's titled Babsy, The Silences of My Life. This is Sadhu Kaili, and she is the director and producer of the film. And she'll be happy to visit with you tonight about it. Uh, so without further ado, we'll see the ex excerpt, and then we'll welcome Babsy to the stage. Your Excellency, the Ambassador of India, I'm so honored that you came. I don't know if you've gone or if you're still here, but I'm really honored that you came. <coughs> and thank you for inviting me to the Jaipur Literary Festival, <coughs> the greatest literary show on earth. Indeed, it is. I want to thank Inprint for everything they've done for me for, for a very long time, Rich Levy. And I'm so glad to see my friend Chitra here. I'll talk to her later on. Uh, let me start. I was about two when I got polio. The doctors advised my parents that since polio affected the nerves, they should not send me to school. She isn't going to become a lawyer or a professor, is she? She'll marry, have children, and settle down. So when I was about eight, I was handed over to Mrs. Pinheiro for light private tuition. Yet the care that was lavished on me at home and the two surgeries to correct the fallen arch of my foot that followed served me well because 10 years later, I was climbing steep mountain paths in the foothills of the Himalayas at a summer cottage in Natyagali, which is almost 9,000 feet above sea level. I have concluded that almost every apparent misfortune has eventually turned out to be in my favor. And contrary to the good doctor's prediction, I did become a professor. Bam. <laughs> I taught at several Ivy League universities in America, Brandeis, Mount Holyoke, Columbia in New York, and at Southampton in England. When on my 10th birthday I received Alcott's Little Women, some favorable aspect in my horoscope must have kicked in. The novel, combined with my loneliness, propelled me into a feast of reading. Books not only took the place of family and friends, but they also unveiled the almost mystic quality that shimmers in beautiful language. By the time I was 13, the world of books and magazines took over my life. There is no doubt in my mind that my polio-stricken reading turned me not only into a writer, but into an almost functioning woman. My reading was indiscriminate. I did not have, an ac have access to a library. I read whatever came my way, and authors like Tolstoy, Henry James, and Balzac found their way to our house as birthday gifts for my brother and me. Our tiny two-shelf library had the obligatory Dickens, some of which I skimmed through with the exception of A Tale of Two Cities, until I came across Pickwick Papers. Pickwick Papers made me laugh out loud. I read it so often that it wore grooves in my brain. I'm sorry, I'm shivering, I'm very cold. A family friend kindly gave me my first P.G. Woodhouse book. It was a landmark occasion. Tap anyone versed in English from the Indian subcontinent and you'll discover a Woodhouse devotee. Are there any Woodhouse devotees here? Yes. Yeah, sure. Another favorite book was Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. I still marvel at his insight into the subtleties of a woman's mind. 
I never had a set time to write. I wrote when the children were at school and my husband at work. I wrote whenever I could snatch a few moments and sometimes through the night. I hastily wrote down narrated jokes or stories I heard or thoughts that suddenly came to me while I was driving on scraps of paper on the backs of receipts. We took very long vacations, sometimes a month, month and a half. But I could always return to the novel where I'd left off. I never write an outline because a story has its own way of expressing itself. One paragraph leads to the next and the next. If I introduce a new character, I work to embed, it, embed the character throughout the story. I knew where I was heading when I started to write and I always had that end in view. I was a child when partition took place. I heard hushed conversations about someone's daughter-in-law, sister or mother, which bewildered me. Older, I realized they were talking about hundreds of thousands of women who were kidnapped and raped during the partition riots. I never met anyone who admitted to having a family member taken away because that would dishonor the family. It was a matter of izzat. This was because it would dishonor, the, in fact, the brutality the women were subjected to was meant to not only dishonor the family, but also the religion the woman belonged to. The Hindu religion, if they ravaged a Hindu woman, the Sikh, if they ravaged a Sikh woman, the Muslim, and so on. I felt very strongly that these bestial kidnappings should be recorded. When I started writing Cracking India, or Ice Candy Man, I had the image of an incident in men, in mind. Men in carts drive into our house in Lahore, intent on looting, thinking we are Hindus. Our mother stood on the veranda with her hands on my and my brother's heads. Our henna-bearded elderly Muslim cook comes out saying, bastards, Bhandara is a Parsi name. They're not Bhandari, they're Bhandara. They're Parsi, not Hindus. He is a Muslim among Muslims. He gives them cold glasses of water, and after a while, they drive away. I used this incident as a climatic scene in my novel. When I start a novel, I imagine a scene, and it often takes place somewhere in the middle of the novel. What brought the crow eaters, which is a, a story of my Parsi uh, community, and they're called crow eaters because they talk nonstop like crows, ka ka ka. You know, it's like the Hindu, I mean the Indian proverb, aap kitni baate kar rahe, aap kawa kha gaye hai. You know, I, and there are Gujaratis here, it is, kitni baato karo, so me kagro khai ki aaj. You know, so it's just familiar everywhere. When, um, when we were, uh, uh, to my mind was, uh, uh, what brought the crow eaters to my mind was a remark by my mother. You know, your father was not always like this. When we were introduced, he asked me, what is your favorite color? And I said, blue. And my father wrote me short letters on blue writing paper. They were not love letters. My father seldom spoke to our mother. He only indicated what he wanted to say by mute signals or conveyed his message through the children. By the time I arrive at this point in the story, I had created characters like the fearsome battle axe Jarbanu and the wily Freddy, who completely took over the book. But my parents, the Hemina and Peshotan Bhandara, remain lesser yet equally memorable characters in my novel, The Crow Eaters. Writing involves editing and re-editing, 
and I must, must confess, I enjoy editing. I write about my friends, and if I use them as characters, I disguise them thoroughly, often changing their sexes. I blithely wrote about my close relatives, knowing that if angered, they would eventually forgive me. I smoked a lot when I wrote. I often wrote in bed lying on my stomach or slouching on pillows. I wrote in my children's exercise books or on rough pads. My first two novels are written entirely by hand, which a kind friend, Nargis Subhani, typed for me. In fact, while I was writing I Scandi Man, Cracking India, I semi-moved to America. And it wasn't until the Bunting Fellowship at Radcliffe, which include the very first Ma uh, Apple Macintosh computer, that I was able to complete the novel. An American brat was prompted partially by my own experiences when I migrated to America from Pakistan. As the mother of two daughters, I had to come to terms with the challenges and fears that Western influences typified. Parsi girls who marry outside the faith are not permitted to attend Zoroastrian temples or prayer ceremonies. Thank God that custom is now slowly withering away. One of my daughters married an American, but given the rigidity of the non-conversion laws, there was not much we could do to reconcile her with the religious community. Although I became an American citizen in 1991, it wasn't until my mother had passed away that I began living in America. Because I semi-moved to America in my mid-30s, Pakistan and India have remained the bedrock of my writing. I became an Indian citizen during my first marriage to an Indian in Bombay and fell in love with Bombay. I just love Bombay. Since I've had a measure of success and enjoy writing, I will continue to write stories until I am able. Thank you. I would like to end on a slightly lighthearted note and narrate a couple of interesting incidents. The shabbily little self-published manuscript of the Crow Eaters was sent by a friend to Khushwan Singh. He was in Bombay. I happened to be in Bombay too, so he kindly invited me to visit him. As I got out of my taxi, a voice hollered, you are an hour late. I don't see people if they're even 15 minutes late. I gazed upon a maze of similar looking buildings and balconies. I'm going to see you only because you've written a first rate book. Come up to the third floor. By the time I climbed up, my heart was fit to burst. Hushwan Singh stood against the open door and ushered me in. Before I had the time to look around, he indicated an attractive middle-aged woman on a charpoy and said, she is much more bedable than her daughter. I was shocked. Her beautiful daughter had married Indra Gandhi's son, Rajiv Gandhi. It was not until I stayed with, with Kushwan Singh and his wife Kawal in Delhi years later that I realized what a dedicated, dedicated writer he was. He dictated his articles from four in the morning to breakfast time. He was too busy to live up to the philandering image he loved to project. It was only a facade. And there's another little incident I'd like to narrate. My brother, Minu Bhandara, was sitting next to Faiz Ahmed Faiz on a flight from Islamabad to Lahore. After chatting for a while, he took a shabby looking book from this pocket and showed it to my brother. To my brother. 
and gave it to him, saying, This book is written by a Parsi woman. Would you know who she is? After leafing through the book, Minu found some of the material uncannily familiar, and he said, I think my sister writes. <laughs> I used to write very, very privately, because you know, I didn't want any of my friends to know. They would say, Babsi na kya likhna hai, romansi likhengi, aur kya karegi? You know, so I didn't. They came straight to a house from the airport, and I was so honored to see Faisab at home. We had only one air conditioner, and it was in the bedroom. My husband and I ushered Fair Sahib to a small alcove there. It had a few chairs and a coffee table. I remember the scene vividly. Before sitting down, Fair Sahib dropped the book on the coffee table and said, have you written this book? Although I recognized it, I wondered why the book had no covers on either end. I said hesitantly, yes, I wrote it. It's a good second-rate book, he announced. Magnanimously. After, oops, oh, oh, I'm reading jokes out of order. After Kushwan Singh's laudatory remarks about the Crow Eater's manuscript, I felt a twinge of disappointment, but coming from Fares, it was nevertheless a compliment. I mumbled, thank you, Fares, sir. He said it's a good book. You write like Narayan, Naipal, and all those other writers, you know who I mean. I revered Naipal. Naipal's writing, I revered Naipal's writing, and I said, but Fair Saab, how can you compare me with Naipal? Oh yes, he said, I can. If Naipal is a second-rate writer, I asked timidly, who do you consider first-rate? Fair said, Shakespeare, Milton, Dante. <laughs> I just looked at him, unable to say anything. We had some tea and samosas and spent a pleasant evening together before my brother took Fair Saab away to have a drink. Fair Saab was pretty fond of drinking. <laughs> I think that's about it. Thank you so very much. I appreciate your listening to me and clapping and making me feel welcome doing that. And I'm sorry I was a little cold and probably shook too much, but uh, thanks a lot for coming. And I thank the Jaipur Literary Festival and in print again, and uh, Mr. Agarwal, because he had sponsored the whole event and he keeps sponsoring them. Thank you all so much. It's our honor now to welcome to the stage Lee Smith. She's the board chair of the Houston Arts Alliance. And she's going to make a presentation to Babsy on behalf of Mayor Sylvester Turner and the city of Houston. Um, and she has something to say. Good evening. I am deeply honored to be here, Babsy. And now I'm going to read every book. You're amazing. Um, we have a proclamation from the city of Houston, and I'll read you some of it. It's, it's easier to read here than the notes that I brought. Babsy Sidwa is an internationally acclaimed and award-winning South Asian author and novelist. She was raised in Lahore, could not attend school due to a childhood bout of polio, and while reading and writing English at home, she became an avid reader. She graduated from Kennard College for Women in Lahore in 1957. Her first two books, The Bride and the Crow Eaters, were published by Jonathan Cape in England in 1980 and 82, after overcoming many publishing hurdles. She continued work on Cracking India, which would go on to become a New York Times Notable Book of the Year and win the Literature Prize in Germany in 1990. Babsy Sidwa, whose life is the subject of a film currently in production, has lived in Houston for 35 years and strives to bring women's issues of the Indian subcontinent into international public discussion. Her public works include five critically acclaimed novels, stories, and essays. She was a Rockefeller Foundation visiting scholar in Italy, and she is a member of the Zoroastrian Hall of Fame in Houston. 
Babsy Sidwa has made great contributions to literary life in Houston as a longtime member of the Board of Directors and Advisory Board of Imprint, a Houston literary arts nonprofit organization established in 1983 and a faculty member at University of Houston and Rice University. She is the recipient of many prestigious awards and honors, including the Bunting Fellowship at Radcliffe Harvard, the first recipient of the South Asian Excellence Award for Literature, and was named among the great immigrants, the pride of America, by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, among many other accolades. On this day, she is honored by imprint at Asia Society Texas for the 2019 Jaipur Literature Festival. The city of Houston commends Babsi Sidwa for her honorable contributions to the world literary community and extends best wishes for continued success. Therefore, Mayor Sylvester Turner has declared today, September 13, 2019, as Babsi Sidwa Day. to Babsy. Babsy told me when I met her before the program that she had been given a commendation by the city maybe 25 years earlier, and this time she's going to write down this date. Okay, Babsy is going to come out to the lobby and sign books, and then there will be a reception, food, drink, and music upstairs. We can celebrate. So, thank you. Thank you, Babsi. Thank you, everybody. Uh, just on behalf of uh, Sanjoy, William Dalrymple, Namita Gokhale, and all my colleagues, just want to uh, say a thank you again to all our festival advisors, Chitra Banerjee, Hari Agarwal, Durga and Sushila Agarwal, Jitain Agarwal, Krupa Parekh, uh, Dr. Marie Guradia, Medha and Shashank Karve, Shazma Martin, Rich Levy, and Stephanie Todd Wing. Of course, as Sanjoy mentioned, it wasn't possible to do this festival without our supporters, sponsors, and donors. So thank you very much for making this happen and making us come back uh, to the second year. And we hope that you'll support us and we'll come back next year and then we'll keep coming back each year. Uh, just to quickly thank them, because of course they deserve it. Uh, Hari and Anjali Agarwal, CNA Metals Limited. Arshad and Shazma Martin. Uh, Durga and Sushila Agarwal. Shashank and Medha Karve, Dr. Mari Guradia, Anne and Albert Chow, Dr. Uh, uh, Shaila and Suman Patel, Meena Mehta, Anu and Arun Agarwal, Francine Neely, uh, Paramita from Double Tree by Hilton, um, uh, Pondicherry Cafe, Anita is also, I think, sitting here. Thank you, Anita, for the wonderful uh, food that we'll eat tomorrow. Uh, our supporters, Houston Arts Alliance and Brazos Bookstores. And apart from that, all the supporters who's been supporting us help to spread the words, thank you very much. And all of you, we create the festivals for you. Without you, we are nothing. So thank you very much for coming and hoping that you're coming with your friends, families tomorrow, and uh, you will support the festival by, uh, by your presence. Uh, as Rich mentioned, we haven't finished yet. We have a wonderful uh, music program upstairs uh, by Indra Nayak and, one, uh, and uh, some delicious food. Uh, dinner is there. So please join us for dinner and reception upstairs. Thank you very much, and have a lovely evening. Thank you so much. I just wanted to, uh, as you go out into the lobby, you'll see the exhibition by Vicky Roy. Uh, Vicky Roy was a young kid who ran away from home and arrived at Salam Balak Trust, a trust that looks after street children, which was set up about 30 years ago. Uh, Vicky was mentored uh, in photography. Uh, he then found Anubhav Nath, who sort of took him under his wing and he interned with a number of photographers, only to be awarded the, uh, by Silverstein uh, Properties and Maybach Foundation. He was selected to uh, go out and record the rebuilding of the World Trade Center. Today, Vicky's work sits in museums across the world, 
and I think he makes more money doing TED Talks than he does anything else. But ladies and gentlemen, please acknowledge Vicky Roy, and Vicky will be there to take you around to show you his photograph. Anubhav, his mentor, is also there. Thank you, Anubhav, for being here. And both of them are available should you want to talk to Vicky and Anubhav about the work in the foyer. Thank you, Asia Society, for making that possible. Join us upstairs. Thank you. <laughs>